Um, I'd like to, as this is one of the, the, the last talks, tie a few things together and lead into the Cape Town Convention, which is, which is appropriate given its, its sweep and its relationship with national law. And so I, I think just from a student's perspective, I'd like to take a bit of a, of a broader look at the technicalities of the Cape Town Convention. So, um, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, I'd like to start with, uh, with a few words about, you could put the previous slide, it's gonna take me a while to get here. <laughs> so just leave, leave it here for now. So I'm, I'm going off, off script a bit to put this in context. Um, I'd like to say a few words about commercial law and transnational commercial law, um, of which the Cape Town Convention is perhaps the exemplar um, in aviation and, and, and generally. But, <clears throat> but I think it's best, uh, one best understands the Cape Town Convention by, by taking a step back and, and saying a few words about, about um, commercial law generally and uh, the law that would govern um, an aircraft finance transaction uh, uh, absent an international treaty, basically what India and most co countries have faced prior to their ratification of the treaty. Um, and, and, and then understand what went into the Cape Town Convention and its core terms before really looking at the precise situation in India today. I think for students, it's, it's important. Um, I think the starting point when I teach uh, commercial and transnational commercial law is to, is to start with the basic question, is the, is, is the purpose of the rules to, to facilitate the type of transaction or is it more prescriptive to regulate, reg regulate the type of a transaction? <clears throat> and when we are dealing with sophisticated parties, aircraft finance transactions, but clearly we're in the category of, of facilitation. That does not mean that there is no role and limit to uh, kind of a regulatory aspect, but the essential feature is to facilitate um, the type of, of transaction. And we're gonna come back to that when we talk about, about the principles of the Cape Town Convention. Um, a second starting point is the distinction between contract and property law. Uh, and I think um, it's always worth going back to that very basic point. Um, broadly speaking, parties have a, a large sphere of party autonomy in India and around the world to choose the law to govern their contract. There are clearly um, some limitations on that. There are very interesting comments made about, about this in the, in the COVID context, but broadly speaking, the, the direction of travel is towards party autonomy and the ability to pick your law. Property law is another matter. The question of what rights you have in assets and what you can do with those assets and the competition between conflicting interests in that asset. And above all, above all, what happens in the insolvency context where there are, it's a zero sum game very often if there are winners and losers, is, um, is really the acid test for understanding um, commercial law. And I think these the basic principles, um, as well as ones that arise from the, the international nature of aircraft finance, um, which give rise to an, an added layer of of interest and complexity, especially on dispute resolution. In many cases, as people on this call know, um, have been decided in London courts involving uh, Indian airlines. And that is because of you know, the particular nature of that. So in thinking about, about um, commercial law, one really needs to look at its purpose here, facilitation among sophisticated parties, the distinction between contract and property law and, and the reasons why there's sensitivity on property law, um, insolvency above all else because of the policy issues implicated for society, um, but the very real risk elements that are present. Um, and I will again come back and comment on uh, Priya's observation. Um, uh, and I guess I, I guess I should at this point <laughs> um, uh, fully disclose, I, I know, people here probably have clicked a few buttons already. The Aviation Working Group is made up of the largest leasing companies, almost without exception, around the world and manufacturers uh, and financial institutions. And so, um, and I'm not speaking for the AWG, I'm speaking for myself in, in an academic context, but um, I will come in a bit uh, uh, on a few of those points that were made in the context of, of what Cape Town was meant to do. Um, including in this kind of a context of, of 
of um, allocation of risk for unforeseen circumstances. Um, and so that the starting point is sort of commercial law. The, 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 the next header to, to address is the transnationalization of commercial law, transnational commercial law, TCL. Um, the transnationalization of commercial law is an attempt, broadly speaking, with various um, uh, features and approaches uh, to, uh, to either unify or ha harmonize to a greater or lesser degree um, aspects of the law uh, applicable to uh, transactions with international uh, features. And over the years, there have been um, a range of, of efforts and instruments uh, to do that, um, starting with soft uh, aspects such as uh, principles to things like model laws to the heavy artillery in this area, which is a treaty. A convention and treaty is the same thing. And the treaty is so important because here the country itself is binding itself as a matter of international law to all other parties that sign the treaty. Um, violations of the Cape Town Con Convention are violations of international law with all that follows from that. Um, and so uh, moving to this heavy aspect uh, to deal with aircraft finance transactions takes these questions into a different zone. I know that there was some discussion about private international law and the Montreal Convention, some similarities there, the rules that apply um, to liability law in, uh, in aviation in India are very different than that apply uh, to non-aviation because of the, uh, the presence of, of um, uh, the Montreal Convention and its, uh, and its uh, predecessors. Um, certainly the same for um, commercial law and aircraft finance and, and leasing, um, which is mainly governed now by the Cape Town Convention, as I'll come to. Um, when transnational commercial law is developed, um, and now um, we move away from facilitating transactions to, to regulating them, now we're dealing with different legal systems and kind of the, the, the and complicated international transactions. And there really are three types of objectives, um, candidates for um, the, the, the motivating um, uh, animating force behind transnational commercial law. One is some, for, some form of balancing legal systems, um, common law and civil law, and those of developing and developed jurisdictions. Um, uh, and, and in life, it's, it's often good to balance things and and to have uh, um, symmetry and and uh, and um, uh, sensitivity to how other people look at things, um, but sometimes uh, balance uh, practically results in abstraction, um, and abstraction um, means that there are not clear rules uh, that parties can uh, rely on um, at the time they enter into risky transactions. And I'll just come in on what what Priya said. Um, without, uh, again, I'm sure that maybe all of the people she spoke with last week are in the AWG, but I think that, that um, the, you know, the, um, the concept of having uh, clear rules rather than standards and rather than evolving norms, argument about, about that, but the commercial side of it is that, um, and I think um, from a creditor's perspective, um, when the rules are clear, as they were under Cape Town in the, in the COVID context in India, the clarity of those rules permitted the lessors uh, to do a lot more than they would have done if the rules were not clear. You know, knowing your rights and, and, and really having a, a pretty good sense of what would happen in court um, allows people to calculate their risk. Um, creditors tend to make worst case scenario assumptions. And when you have uncertain outcomes, you will see uh, more conservative behavior. And um, I could give my many, too many years in the industry can, can cite many examples of, of, of aggressive um, creditor behavior in the face of uncertainty. Think uh, Swiss Air and Sabina and other cases in which there were real questions about what would happen. Um, and therefore, you know, creditors move to act uh, before um, because it was unclear what would happen in insolvency. And so um, I would just say that the, the kind of counter to, to, uh, to, to Priya's um, understandable aspiration here is that, is that clear rules 
provide um, a, a, a nice frame for for uh, negotiation, renegotiations, and concessions, as was as was really was seen in the COVID context. I'll I'll leave that that point alone there. Um, but once you start to balance legal systems and have abstractions, then often you lose that. A second candidate is reducing transaction costs by 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 simplifying things, um, avoiding uh, conflict of law analysis. Again, which which besides maybe helping some law firms because of its complexity, does increase transaction costs and, and um, does leave open a much wider range of potential outcomes that have to be assumed. Um, and the third, um, which really is the Cape Town Convention example, is to facilitate the transaction type. As I said before, Cape Town was, was purposefully designed to facilitate secured financing and leasing of aircraft. There is no question about that I speak with, I think, um, complete authority on that point is, you know, the point person from the beginning on this, that was the purpose. Um, the Aviation Working Group um, with IATA, uh, we took joint positions with the Airline Association for five years. We never had a different, uh, a different position for five years. And our joint position was that uh, every provision of the Cape Town Convention individually and, um, and uh, the treaty as a whole uh, needs to be assessed against the uh, the criteria of its ability to facilitate financing, increase the availability, and then reduce the cost of financing. Um, and so Cape Town really was a deal, um, uh, which was more clarity and predictability um, based on accepted international practices um, uh, in exchange for um, uh, more liquidity and a loosening of, of credit and better terms. And that can never be forgotten uh, because uh, it is the the architecture, and everything is understood really by uh, by by seeing that. And so, the Cape Town Convention is uh, purpose built for that purpose. Um, it is certainly a rules rather than a standards based instrument. It focuses on ex ante efficiency and predictability rather than um, ex post dispute resolution. It is quite comprehensive. It does not displace all national law, but it displaces a lot of national law and does so on purpose. Again, seeking uh, best, uh, best practices and best, and best principles. The Cape Town Convention, I think, uh, can fairly be stated, um, is the most successful and certainly the most impactful commercial law treaty ever. Um, and there are over 80 ratifying states. There are I think, one or two treaties that have a little bit more, but those are much more elective. Cape Town is mandatory. So if one looked at the actual um, um, the impact of the treaty can't be can't be questioned, and one has to also remember when the treaty was developed, um, uh, India as well as Russia, China, Brazil were really coming into the aviation um, industry space, um, uh, and uh, and there really was a desire to have uh, best international practices for those countries, um, and that really was a, a motivator uh, early on, um, and so kind of with that I'll. I'll kind of turn to Cape Town, but keep keep this slide, please. Um, so, what now? Applying a bit of what I said, um, the Cape Town Convention um, seeks, in a in a sweeping way, to uh, in a sweeping way. Um, I've lost I've lost the picture of myself, which is a good thing. I just want to make sure you could still hear me. Uh, please confirm. Absolutely, we can hear you. Okay, much better much better to, to hear me than to to see me. Uh, if you have to do. If you have to no, hear we me, can see you, Jeffrey. We can oh, see you. Okay. We can hear you. Okay. 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 Because I, I disappeared from my screen, which is which is good. At least I don't have to see myself. Um, and the the Cape Town Convention uh, did approach uh, the the questions that I've said in a comprehensive way. It deals fundamentally with property law, which is the sensitive area. It deals with insolvency, which had never never been addressed in a in a treaty prior to the Cape Town Convention. Um, it created hard substantive law on the creation um, and effects of uh, property interest and enforcement. Um, uh, and, um, and it did so in a mandatory way based upon um, very cutting edge uh, principles like uh, the use of, uh, of a high tech electronic registry, which maybe now seems um, um, natural, but uh, rest assured in uh, in the late 90s, it was anything but that, and uh, it was very controversial to move to 
uh, electronic uh, systems. Um, and uh, it and it did so with with great great, uh, if I could use the word, great elegance. I mean, if you read the treaty, the simplicity um, in what it takes to create an international property interest. You you need to do uh, four things: simple, simple, basic um, steps, rather than the, the the types of things that might be seen around the world. Conditions being added to create the interest to perfect the interest, to give it effect, effects against third parties, all one needs to do is, is uh, make a notice-based electronic red, uh, registration. Um, the priority rules are as simple as they can be. First to file wins, first to file wins. Um, and there are very few exceptions to that. Just and the main one is for uh, government creditors of which I'll say more in a bit. But overall, you have uh, in, in this thing. And, and, and as students, I really would encourage you to read it, read, read the treaty, um, uh, not, not only for its content, but for the, 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 you know, the, the elegance of it. Professor Good, uh, leading, I'm sure, leading, leading authority in the world on commercial law and someone that I had the great pleasure to, to teach with for a long time, chaired the drafting committee. And it's, uh, it is concise, it, is, um, it, it has, a common law tilt, let's say, but it, it incorporates a lot of civil law concepts. Um, and it is uh, simple and, and clear. And you can learn uh, a lot um, uh, in your practices and, and in your thinking by, by reading that. It's well, well, well worth it. Um, and, uh, and so the treaty is, is important. Um, and now I'll get to my my, my PowerPoint and just a reality check. Uh, yeah, I know I started 15 minutes late. When would you like me to stop? Just give me a, give me a number of minutes and then open for questions. So just tell me the number of minutes and then I'll stop at that point. We can go on for another 20 minutes. Yep. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll speak. Okay, I'll speak. I, I have some conflicts myself coming up. I'll speak a bit more and then we'll open the floor because I do want to make myself available to, to the students um, yeah. to answer in, in anything, including anything uh, addressed throughout the last two days, even though I didn't hear it. Um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the the Cato Convention, and now you can go to the, the next slide, um, please, um, or the first slide. Um, okay, so um, I think I've already covered um, 1A, that's all I've covered, really, um, but um, I'm going to um, you know, give a little bit of a background. I am going to talk about compliance with the treaty, which is really important um, and something that people don't look at and uh, talk about economics a bit. And then I'll turn straight to uh, what's happening in India. Next slide. Um, the, um, I mentioned all this. I think the, the points to really understand, I think here is um, um, there are 83 uh, countries um, that uh, have ratified. India, of course, is, is one of them. Um, a lot of work went into the ratification and the implementation of the treaty. I mean, I had the, the pleasure, I think I've, I think I've been to India maybe 15 times on, on this and related things over the years. It's been uh, you know, a great, great pleasure. I, I miss it very much and can't wait to come back. Um, uh, but, um, and many colleagues on this phone are dear to me and um, uh, really uh, India played an important role. And it was, it was a hard treaty you know, to, to, uh, to ratify because it's so powerful. Um, and it took a lot of consensus building and socialization. And, and we had a lot of real experience in regulations and in spice jets and in, and in other cases, which I'll come to in a, min in a minute. But, uh, but it's very important, it's very impactful. Um, you sh one should make note of, of the dates, as I said, it was, it was uh, things were a lot different in India uh, when the treaty was negotiated in the early 90s. Um, and it was a different industry with different characteristics. And, um, and uh, no doubt the question was attracting uh, uh, finance. The government, the government's role in the industry um, was it, you know, still evolving, of course, but it was very, very different there. And it does make sense to look at things with some, some perspective. Next slide, please. Um, I, I, I wish to, because I'm not going to go into every detail of the, the Cape Town Convention, what, what, what's really uh, of overriding importance now is, is uh, compliance. And by that, I mean government compliance um, with, uh, with the obligations that they've undertaken. 
And by compliance, uh, we mean, and the AWG, we have an index where we assess and rank all countries um, um, on their compliance. It's a predictive index, as we'll, we'll see. But by compliance, we mean that uh, the, the short way to put it is it would be reasonable to rely on, it would be reasonable for parties to rely on the terms and the intent of the treaty. Uh, it's one thing to just have a treaty or have a law, but if it doesn't um, work in practice, if it's changed for whatever reason, and I, and I don't want to, to comment on whether it's good or bad to, to uh, uh, reinterpret or change law, you could probably guess what I think about that, but I think it's, it's, it's cl clearly the case that, that if a treaty is not fully implemented, so it has the force of law and it prevails over conflicting law, conflicting national law, then it's not reasonable to rely on. And so uh, much of the work that we do around the world on a daily basis is to, uh, to um, uh, ask India and Russia and China and every other country that ratified to keep their treaty obligations, which they've made, meaning uh, that they comply with the treaty and that they have sufficiently complete implementing rules and regulations so that um, as a practical matter, uh, a government officials, um, courts and authorities can take action. They have the information to do that. Um, and so our index you know, seeks to help um, incentivize that compliance and to, uh, to help investors um, take a view on uh, whether it's reasonable to rely upon uh, the treaty that's been, uh, been ratified. Um, next slide, please. Um, um, I'm not going to spend much time on, on this. You could find all this on the EWG website. Um, uh, it explains, um, again, from a student's perspective, I would, I would encourage you to read what might be uh, um, a, a bit of a terse document. There's a document on the website, the, the, the methodology for our system, which explains, uh, next slide, please. Okay, I hope the formula is up there. Okay, so this is the form formula we use, um, and uh, there's a lot packed into this. And um, and if you look at the methodology, you could learn a lot. Um, so this this index is meant to uh, predict um, the next case, whether it is what is the probability that the treaty's terms and intent will be uh, accurately followed um, in the next case, um, and that is. Um, the, the way we approach it. And the first half of the formula, A and B, are, let's call it uh, uh, directly relevant law. So A is, has India, this is applies to everybody, have they implemented the treaty such that it has the force of law with uh, priority in the case of conflict over conflicting law with sufficient completeness to give decision makers um, information to, uh, to take decisions uh, accurate decisions. And B is what's happened in practice, actually, cases and controversies. The last 50% are more predictive, and they deal with, um, and, and this, you know, we designed this formula ourselves. It was very bespoke. They deal with political risk. They deal with existing principles of Indian law for gap filling. It deals with uh, whether they qualify for the OEC discount, because that then provides a further incentive to comply. Um, and whether uh, the government has established a communication channel to work with us in problem solving. But take a look at the methodology because um, it really explains the, the heart of, of uh, law and law assessment from a, a financier's perspective. Next slide, please. Next slide, if you can. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip over these. These just explain the variables. Next slide. Um, this is a. a uh, I'm a, um, as as mentioned in the bio. I'm um, I'm on the, the faculty at uh, uh, University of Oxford, and and now we we started a project with Unidwa and the AWG on uh, economic assessment of of law reform, and um, uh, and so uh, this chart um, really looks at. Uh, questions of uh, risk reduction and political risk and how um, those are key. Uh, this project is under the, the umbrella of, of that pro those projects, those institutions, um, how they, um, they could um, re reduce risk. And I think the, the key point here is, uh, is, is variable D, which is whatever benefits a treaty 
may have A, B, and C risk reduction if, uh, if the treaty is not followed because of reasons of political and institutional risk, um, uh, then the value can really just goes down to zero. Uh, then the law is abstract. And, and I say that as I lead into the India case. So when we look at what's happened in India, um, I think it's against the backdrop of uh, to what extent uh, were treaty obligations or are treaty obligations being uh, and expected to be complied with in the real world. Next slide. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I won't say much about that, except um, I, and I'm sure you've heard in the other talks that um, one declaration in particular, there are, there are two that are particularly important, declarations or choices that are, that are made at the time the treaty is ratified, and India made, made excellent ones, but two of them that are particularly important are the one, or one dealing with bankruptcy, and, um, and uh, India opted into uh, so-called Alternative A, which is a, uh, a, a very clear rule as to what happens to assets in bankruptcy um, um, that provides uh, predictability and certainty, can be negotiated and changed by the parties, often is done. But, uh, but it's a clear rule rather than, than uh, a stay on enforcement. Um, that policy decision was made by the Indian government. Uh, it's not open for discussion now, it's been made. So the question is only whether it's, it's followed in practice. Um, and uh, the system for deregistering aircraft. I'll say a few words on that. Next slide. Um, these slides, um, um, and I think you'll have access to them, but they show that uh, the rating agency is not just, uh, mo most transactions are still leasing transactions in India, but um, the, the wider aviation community, sophisticated community, the rating agencies uh, really do look very carefully as to whether the treaty uh, is properly implemented and complied with. Having a treaty without compliance is, you know, is really um, a, a null set. Ne next slide. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, just more, more of the same. Uh, the OECD, um, there is a discount available to airlines who use export credit um, if they, the country qualifies. India currently does not qualify um, for reasons I'll come to in a moment. Um, and we have been working closely and we, I think we're getting quite close. We only have one more important thing to be done, I think, for India to qualify. Um, we're almost there, say 90%, um, but we need to be 100% there to qualify, it's binary. Um, but the, uh, the OECD and international export credit, there is a 10% discount um, if, if a country is, is eligible uh, and is on the list. And, and uh, we uh, certainly hope to see India on the list uh, soon. Next slide. Okay, so India. Uh, India ratified the treaty and it made all of the right declarations, that is the ones that would, that were designed to facilitate aircraft finance. Uh, those include um, timetable, court timetables. Um, you know, India is known to uh, have uh, lengthy and protracted court proceedings. India has made a decision and has committed itself to uh, to agree to timetables in connection with, uh, with uh, certain uh, judicial proceedings under Cape Town. It's agreed to non-judicial remedies. It has agreed to a simplified uh, one-party system for deregistration of aircraft. It has agreed uh, to choice of law uh, freedom. Um, and most importantly, it's agreed to alternative A, which basically says that there is a maximum time period as India ratified of uh, two months before aircraft should be uh, returned or debts should be cured unless the parties agree otherwise. So India did this all uh, perfectly, uh, the ratification. Next slide. Um, these are the key things that happened over the years. And um, you'll notice that uh, a number of these happened uh, quite a bit after India ratified. So there was a, a long period um, in which a number of necessary rules uh, to 
uh, implement and comply with the treaty were not present. Um, but um, but but we've gotten there with one uh, overriding exception, and you, they're, they're listed there. Regulations were uh, promulgated um, uh, consistent with Cape Town under Rule 30 sub 7 and 32A of the aircraft or rules 1937. Uh, standard operating procedures uh, were issued for uh, deregistration of aircraft. Um, uh, real progress was made on uh, export uh, in, uh, in regulations from the Reserve Bank of, uh, of India. Uh, and, uh, and then the Civil Aviation Authority kind of swept it all together um, in June, uh, uh, 15 June, with, uh, with even, even tighter uh, procedures on recordation. All that is really, really good. Um, great news. So uh, the declarations are great. The, uh, the implementation has been great with one exception, slide 15. So slide 15, um, under, uh, as everyone on this call knows much better than I, um, in India, it is necessary uh, for there uh, to be uh, express primacy of the Cape Town Convention um, uh, over conflicting law. Um, we went through years of discussions about harmonious construction and how everything should, courts should try to get things to work together. Of course they should and they will, but, but, but you know, they won't because there are straight conflicts and there's a straight conflict uh, between alternative A and the automatic stay in insolvency proceedings. There's no way to harmonize those. And so what is needed is primary legislation um, uh, to make sure that Cape Town prevails in the case of a conflict in particular, um, uh, uh, to the extent of any inconsistency with the quote, new in Indian Bankruptcy Act. Um, and so we, there's been drafts of legislation floating around for years. I know that uh, we have a, a, a very good draft that's in circulation now, um, uh, and, and we hope that, that we could all together push that over the line. That would re produce substantial economic benefits, would make uh, India eligible for the CTC discount. Um, there may be another way or an element to do that by a, de a, 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 a central government declaration under 14.3 of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Act. Um, exempting from the automatic stay Cape Town uh, provisions. But this provision, this is the most important point. Um, I know I'm speaking to students here, but if I were speaking to government officials and practitioners, it, it's all about slide 15 as far as the future is concerned. Next slide. Um, uh, this is a uh, way to, uh, to uh, uh, synthetic a uh, summary of, of what's happened in court over the years. Um, and I should say uh, the starting point was uh, for Cape Town uh, applied uh, in, in, uh, in Indian courts, but that's more historical. But, um, but, but since India uh, ratified um, good decisions in SpiceJet um, upholding, um, uh, upholding Cape Town generally, referring to uh, India's international law obligation, um, even if there wasn't the primacy uh, rules, um, but did rely upon uh, existing Indian uh, regulations on deregistration uh, to justify uh, Cape Town consistent outcomes. Then in JET, before uh, the insolvency, um, there were uh, there was a number of, of, of kind of tangles with the civil aviation authorities, and, and that gave rise to close work between AWG and, uh, and some people uh, on this, uh, this video um, to come up with uh, the above mentioned uh, rules, which, which are really good. When insolvency took place, the court did impose a, a general insolvency stay, um, which, uh, which uh, uh, caused a problem and, and, and it worked itself out given commercial reality, but it is a, uh, a problem. It's a legal problem and, um, uh, and, and parties will, will need to uh, assume that problem unless we could pass the, the primacy legislation. So with that, I'll stop. Um, I, I thank you all for uh, bearing, bearing with me and especially at the end of the, of the conference. And I'm open to any question on this or anything else um, uh, in the aviation finance space, uh, which you'd like uh, my careful views on.
Thank you, Jeffrey. This is, a, this, this, is, this is very, very insightful, and I'm sure you want to respond to Priya on multiple points, considering, of course, every single lessor, you know, is a member of AWG, and we work with them so closely. But there are some questions coming up from students. If we could take a few. Of course. And I, I prefer, if there's, a, if there's a limitation on time, I prefer the questions from the students, please. Yeah. So, okay, we'll just take the questions from the students then. Okay. So the question is from Anulika, she's asking, so where is India in comparison to other developing economies in the scoring of the CC of the balance index? Um, someplace in the middle. Um, uh, on, on And if you go to the Aviation Working Group's website, I think there's a public and a private uh, part. The public part gives uh, gives scores. Um, uh, so you'll see where India is. Um, uh, India uh, is, you know, someplace in the middle, maybe on, uh, against the, the word was developing countries. Um, but I could say if uh, if 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 India uh, passes the primacy law, it will be uh, it'll be high because. Um, as I said, the, the, through all of those actions that were taken, um, there really is, and, and then and the court cases, the way they've worked out, there really is only one problem left. So with this one change, we would expect to see a very high score. So it's, you know, uh, it's on the high side of, of the middle um, um, among developing uh, countries. Um, I wouldn't call them developing countries, but with this one change, uh, India would be, would be high. So lots of good news one and only one thing to do. And I would just say one thing, and again, I, there are probably a lot of, you know, uh, lawyers here, um, I mean, from other firms. I mean, I think the the, the work that's been done um, uh, collectively, uh, again, uh, uh, Mia was involved and, and her colleagues at Link Legal, and, and I, I'd be remiss not mentioning um, Robbie Nath from, uh, from RNC, who coordinates the India Contact Group. Um, uh, all the main lawyers are involved, and a lot of the airlines have been involved. And there's been a real, really a cooperative approach, um, you know. And it's really important to do that because, in the grand scheme of things, um, it is, you know, it is penny wise and, and pound foolish to uh, to try to take advantage um, of 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 something. Um, it, may, it may, you know, you may have a client, and you're under pressure to do that. But um, but uh, that same client uh, may be in bankruptcy and a month from now, they may come out of bankruptcy and they may want to borrow, borrow money. And so, um, you know, this is rule of law thinking and, and, and we, we pitch it high. So it's been, you know, it's really been a great experience working with India, I, I'd say. Again, we have one major problem outstanding, but all in all, it's been a great pleasure, uh, including with many people on this call, uh, including some government officials, uh, and I, you know who you are. Um, Absolutely, Jeffrey, yes. Um, and I'm sure the government and AWG and everybody else is working to sort that out, and I'm sure it will be. Another question is from Prakriti. She is asking, a CTC bill was introduced in 2018. However, nothing seems to have moved. Could you please throw some light? Nothing has moved. Well, I don't know. I mean, the, if you're talking about the legislation, um, yeah. If, if, yeah. if that's the question, <laughs> well, um, let, 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 let me say uh, discretion is the better part of valor. That's all I'd like to say on that. Okay, let's take another one. So what initiatives, uh, this is from again, uh, Anuveka, she's asking, what initiatives can be taken by various governments to achieve net zero? Your views on ESG? Well, um, I, know, I saw what uh, down to speak on here, and um, um, I, uh, although I must say, I agreed only to speak on Cape Town, um, but, um, but, we're here, so why not? Um, so uh, let me just say, I mean, the, the AWG is uh, probably the most active party on, on ESG for the least in the financing community. Um, and, we, and we really are, and something's on our website and much more is not on our website. Um, but we are in the, in the middle of discussions with, uh, with, with parties. Um, was the question what governments can do or what industry? I didn't, can you just restate no, the question? I think it's a very general question about what, uh, what, what do you think the initiative should be in general, you know, to get to net zero by 2050? Yeah, I mean, this, of course, we could spend a day on, but I, I, I would say, um, I'm more comfortable commenting uh, from a leasing and financing perspective on the, on the question. Um, the, um, 
you know, we, we all know the, the types of things that, that, that can and can't be done. We, we, we all know that uh, we, we must deal in, in our industry with, you know, with the, the law of physics and we cannot snap our fingers and expect to see electric aircraft and use of hydrogen you know, tomorrow. We cannot also uh, snap our fingers and, and, and like to see the, uh, uh, the, the amount of uh, alternative uh, fuel, SAF fuel, um, which you know has uh, you know net zero emissions over over its life cycle, um, these issues are just are very very large and um, and um, but you know efforts clearly uh, are rapidly accelerating on the technological side on on the SAF side um, on uh, trying to make you know operations and, and air navigation more efficient to to reduce all those things. Um, we we are uh, we are looking at things really from the question of, and this is the financing side of it, is that uh, there is an increasing amount of pressure on um, on uh, financiers, lenders, investors uh, to uh, uh, allocate or reallocate their capital to uh, to ever more green green purposes, and the question of how the industry looks at. Um, you know, at green concepts and green financing, what the criteria is, uh, is, you know, one of the two or three most important issues we'll be facing as an industry over the years to come. The, 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 the action right now is, is really at the European level. I think many people here have heard about the, uh, the EU taxonomy on green financing. I mean, even though it's, um, because many of the lenders, Indian lenders and the Indian lessors are European entities. And so uh, they are subject to this, this, this thinking. Um, uh, it looks to where the, 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 the lessor uh, is and uh, that the rules will apply to them. And so the question is, how will they assess the operations of the, of the airlines and what have they done and what, and what steps will be taking? Um, and we are uh, you know, right in the middle of, a, of an absolutely critical you know, discussion, negotiation on on, on that, um, I would just say that um, that um, there will there will there just will be increasing you know pressure uh, on the on the industry to uh, you know improve um, uh, uh, technologically improve uh, uh, emissions through uh, uh, aircraft type, um, and we're trying to you know ensure that the transition uh, is done in a way that's not. Uh, prejudicial to different people in the you know in the value chain and people that have different types of aircraft. Um, so um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, absolutely. Uh, but, yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah, absolutely. Jeffrey. One last very interesting question is, uh, you know, why is there an absence of post major in leasing agreements of aviation companies? <laughs> I know it's not absolutely CTC, but I think you just agreed to answer all the questions that are coming up throughout yeah. the seminar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like uh, that's it, it's a uh, it's fair game. Um, okay, well, since we're since we're going there, let's let's uh, let, let me just say, okay, um, um, and I remember, you know, uh, when contracts were a bit different. I, I think first of all, um, for completeness, um, uh, we might as well. Um, put put out. If you if you we're talking about legal concepts or or provisions which um, have been or could be implicated in the COVID context, right? And so, if you took um, operating leases and loan agreements and purchase agreements, the three things you've been you've been discussing, you know, so far, you know, operating agreements. There are there are contractual outs for performance. There's the question of force majeure and impossibility, and then there's termination and bankruptcy. That's kind of what we've seen there. Loan agreements, um, different types of things, and purchase agreements, usually it was uh, material adverse changes and excusable delay and liquidated damage type concepts. The question, since it was on force majeure, um, I'll, I'll put this in the, in the operating lease box because that's probably where, where it came up. Uh, it also, uh, the other related concept is, is legal impossibility, which, which is kind of a, a, a sister side. But... But on the core question of, and this came up and, and Priya said it before, um, risk allocation in the aviation industry um, for many, many, many years was, uh, was uh, you know, based upon the concept of, you know, of a hell or high water clause. Hell and high water clause says, you know, 
come hell or high water, come COVID or anything else, um, uh, uh, payment is made, rather than a force majeure clause, which which says the opposite. Now, you know, the industry could have developed another way, and theoretically it could develop another way, but there are great costs associated with that. You know, I think it, it's easy to say, we'd like a force majeure clause, but <laughs> many things would follow from that. Many, many adverse things would follow from that to the airlines, to the airlines. Um, you know, when I hear comments, it's almost as, well, that's just something we want. It, it wouldn't be that simple. It, it's the whole structure of the economics of the industry, which is that the allocation, um, you know, um, with very few uh, has been uh, has been um, made in the contract, and um, and that is the, the the basis of it. And then that you know permits the uh, the renegotiation. And then if the airline, you know, of course, can file bankruptcy, and 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 that changes the bargaining power, and um, and bankruptcy law with alternative A, you know, produces. Um, um, you know, uh, outcomes. But but to, to just, uh, you know, sort of say, you know, tomorrow there should be a force majeure clause, um, I think, um, you know, that is, uh, I'm not surprised what the, the 10 lessors who spoke to, uh, to Priya said, because it, it's so fundamental to, you know, to the, the, the basic economics. I would just point out one other thing, um, which AWG has done a lot of work on. Um, some countries have made a parallel argument about Cape Town and said, force majeure, we don't have to follow Cape Town. Things are, no. when we ratified the treaty, we didn't expect this. I know we have an obligation, but gosh, this, things are difficult now. We don't want to follow our treaty obligation. It's the same idea, same logic. Um, and of course, we've uh, um, taken great issue with that. And, and I think international law um, does not permit uh, the, the concept because when people are, are entering these fundamental things, now, the idea is is a predictability based system. I think that, you know, um, when you look at what happened in India, I think it's a. I mean, I think it's. I think it's worked out very well. It's really worked out re remarkably well, considering the 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 the, the severity of the situation. Um, and uh, and I think that certainty, the predictability, the commercial predictability, has been the backbone of the ability to work things out.